all of you, unless you're more active. Uh, we were um, last minute at the university, so this goes back to the uh, last millennium. Um, Alessia did the master in Padua and PhD as well. Uh, she also went to the PhD in uh, at uh, ISO, right? MPA. MPA. With a first uh, master at thesis on uh, the chemical evolution model of, of chemical evolution of the interplaster medium. And then she went on, uh, on the PhD to study globular cluster systems in extended galaxies. Uh, then uh, her career uh, had a, like, a twist because she uh, passed on instrumentation. She was doing modeling for adaptive optics. Uh, for quite the long uh, yes, That's quite the long yard. And then she went back to galaxy evolution uh, in the group uh, uh, of uh, the which I also belonged. And uh, of course, uh, uh, you've had uh, some talk about this by myself about this gas collaboration. But she would present a sort of follow up, which is uh, around pressure, but in a uh, more distant uh, galaxy. And uh, before I forget, uh, uh, for the students and everyone, everybody else who wants to join for lunch, uh, let's meet at uh, uh, 10 to 2 uh, here in front uh, of the entrance. So, thank you, Jacopo. So, it's a great pleasure to be here. I've never been on this side of the ocean, so it's my first time in North America. Uh, <laughs> and I really like uh, this campus, it's a very beautiful location. So the talk today will be about the round pressure stripping at work in intermediate Russian clusters, and in particular in these two clusters, about 2744 and about 370, which have a ratio that is uh, 0.3 and 0.38. So we are looking back uh, at the when the age of the universe was uh, three giga years younger than today. So I know that Jacopo told you everything you wanted to know about the round pressure stripping, but I still need to introduce because I'm not able how to do so. So it will be a short introduction. So why do we care about the pressure stripping? This is a very basic information that is um, just meant to tell you that something is happening in dense environment and this something is shaping galaxy properties in a way that uh, the, the mixture of early type galaxies and late type galaxies strongly depends on the uh, density of the environment. But uh, this is the well-known morphology density relation that we derived in Wings cluster. So Wings is a survey of nearby clusters in a redshift range uh, between 0 0.04 and 0 0.07. Um, it collects data for more than 70 clusters in this redshift red range. Now, the morphology density relation dates back uh, to the 80s. It uh, was something that Alan Dresser published first. And basically it tells you that when the local density of galaxies increases, so when you move to the right of this plot, the, the fraction of galaxies that are early type, these red points is increasing and the fraction of late type is decreasing, okay? So when you move, especially towards the cluster center, you find mostly quenched galaxies. So what is quenching these galaxies? There are many things that can happen and I will show you later on uh, which are these mechanisms and why we are interested in the round pressure stream. So the other thing that happens, that this is, these are all uh, um, well-known things, but I'm using here only the wings results. So it happens that the star formation rate density decreases as a function of time when you go to lower redshift. And if you look at the bottom panel here, you see that if you look at cluster galaxies, here trace are um, as red and triangles, the decrease is much stronger in dense environment than in the field. And these colored dots refer to field uh, galaxies. So the suppression of the star formation is particularly efficient in clusters. Plus, the last thing, if you look at the population of passing emission line and post-starburst galaxies, you see something that I already said, the increase of passing galaxies, the decrease of emission line galaxies, and if you look carefully at the distribution of post population, it increases strongly when you move toward the cluster sample. Now, post galaxies are those that have the signatures that are typical of a fast quenching phenomenon because you don't have any more emission lines, but you still have the strong Bauman absorption lines. That means that eight type stars are still living and you don't have any more gas. So that's why we think it's a signature of a fast um, 
process and RAM resuscitation is actually a fast process. Now, yes, what can happen in clusters? Many things. So galaxies can interact one with each other, they can merge, there are um, tidal interaction and so on. This mechanism though affect both the gas and the stars. While there are two mechanisms that are run resistripping and strangulation or starvation that act only on the gaseous components. The run pressure stripping is, as I say, the fast mechanism. The removal lasts less than one giga year. The starvation is longer, takes longer time, up to five giga years or so. The run pressure stripping removes the gas from the galaxy disk. The starvation removes the gas from the halo surrounding the galaxy. And this is something that you probably will see here. Okay, this is a picture of how run pressure stripping works as the disk galaxies fall into the cluster potential in their movement toward the cluster center. The atomic gas, the neutral gas that is in the galaxy disk, start to get stripped because it feels the high pressure of the intracluster medium. And this effect is a stronger, um, depends on how. Uh, strong is the pressure of the intercluster medium, and um, how fast is the um, velocity trajectory uh, toward the cluster center? And this is a very old equation by Gunn and Gott, 1972, that still holds with some caution, but still holds. This is what happens, so this is what we see. So, do these galaxies exist in reality? Yes, so we know that. We know that since the late 90s. 90s, uh, because there have been observation by, uh, for example, Kine group, Kupan and Kine, of the Virgo and Coma clusters, where you see evidence of uh, H1 truncated disk. This is. But uh, thanks to Yag and collaborators, 2020 and 2017, uh, the H alpha emission started to be used as a tracer of rapid sustainable. These are um, Taste of H alpha gas. This is not spectra, it's H alpha imaging. And then something happened lately, lately and it's the advent of integral field units. So, this is a galaxy that's seen, uh, it belongs to the Shapley supercluster. So, it is in the Wings redshift range and, in fact, is a part of gas survey as well. I will show you later its image. And this is the first example that Paula Mabuzzi and her group found using the wide spectrograph of the Australian telescope. You see here the H alpha emission traced as contours departing from this galaxy that is seen on the stage on. And then the uh, MUSE came into play. And so this is the first study using uh, MUSE to detect this beautiful long tail of H alpha emission departing from the galaxy is 137001. If you look at this galaxy in the optical, you see nothing. It's only when you have the new spectra in your hands that you see these tails of each other. That is very normal. Okay. I'm sorry, but that's only because the larger telescope. No, it's because in a, it's an integral field spectrograph. So you have an image, and for each pixel in the image, you have the spectrum there. Before that, you could only have the I don't know, long slit spectroscopy or fiber spectroscopy. So you, you have signature of rampers of sleeping, for example, as I say, the Postalbus galaxy. Postalbus. The image on the grayscale, what was it from? Where was it? The left. This one over here is in the optical. But which transcript? I don't remember. Oh. I don't remember. Um, I check. Yeah. So, ah, now I see your question. You wanted to say that if you had a big enough telescope, you could collect lots of photos showing this. No, this is not the case. I think this is VLT. It's a big telescope, or HST maybe. So this is why we started the GASP survey, because there were cases of rampers steel galaxies. We had a, a large sample of clusters, and we wanted to analyze in a more statistical way the effect and the importance of ground pressure stripping. And this is why, well, Bianca basically went, Bianca and Gianni Fasano, who is now retired, went to look at the big band images of all our clusters, looking for galaxies that were showing signature of an asymmetric distribution of some kind. And obviously, 
this survey is biased because they were looking for such signatures in the B band. That means that the tails of our galaxies are obviously star forming. This is not an H1 selected sample, it's an optically selected sample. Um, so we selected galaxies belonging to different environments. We have galaxies in clusters, in group, in the field, plus a certain number of galaxies that sh were showing no emission at all. They have different masses going from 10 to the 9 to 10 to the 11.5 and a different degree of stripping, stripping, which means basically a different importance of the tail length over the galaxy body. And we observe them with mules. More than 100 galaxies with a pixel scale of 0.2 arc second, but then the, the C comes into play. So at the end, the special resolution of our observation is one arc second. And that the redshift of these galaxies, this corresponds to one kiloparsec. So we will have, we had, we have um, resolved the spectra on a special scale of one kiloparsec, not, not less. The field of view of muse is one by one at minute, which at this ratio corresponds to 60 by 60 kiloparsecs. Okay, this is just a gallery of gas galaxies. Um, the grayscale image shows you the collapsed light from the entire data cube. It's like an op basically an optical image of the galaxy. Um, where you see that many of these galaxies, look at this, which is the prototypical jellyfish galaxies that we have. When you look at the optical image, you see it is disturbed, but it looks pretty normal, this one as well. And when you look instead at the colored maps, which are tracing the HF emission, you see this beautiful tail of ionized gas departing from the galaxy's body. And this is something that uh, points toward ground pressure strictly, but then you have to do the complete analysis to see whether it is only the gases component that gets disturbed leaving undisturbed the stellar component. This is the, the basic thing that you need to know before saying, okay, that is ground pressure stream. So I'm not showing you any of the gas results because we are moving now to higher redshift, um, but the, the, there's plenty of literature on this. So let's see what happens at higher redshift. Do we see evidence of ground pressure strip galaxies at higher redshift as well? Yes. These are famous examples taken from Owen collaborators, Cortez and others, and these are ACS data, so uh, space telescope images. For example, this one by Luca Cortese is a beautiful example of a galaxy that is clearly affected by an pressure. The main galaxy body is this one, and you see all these trays of gas filled with knots emitting in the blue light, which means there is star formation going in this strip gas. But these are visual classification. This is something that, I mean, you can say there is an pressure strip ongoing only when you see this clear example. I will show you later that in about 27, 44, and 370, most of the galaxies that we classified as an pressure strip in the uh, ACSD images were looking pretty normal. <laughs> There, have, there, have been, there has been an attempt to use the slitless spectroscopy of HST to classify disturbed galaxies. I never understood how slitless spectroscopy works, but this authors basically try to use this method to say whether a galaxy looks regular, clumpy, concentrated, or asymmetric, as in this case. And as you will see later, some of the galaxies that we observed in 2744 and 370 are part of this. Uh, uh, slitless spectroscopy work, and they were looking normal even using slitless spectroscopy. That, that's just to say that unless you have a very powerful interior field unit, the effects of ground pressure stripping could be um, neglected at all. You, you don't see it. Sorry, what does regular mean in this context? An undisturbed galaxy, which doesn't seem undisturbed yeah, here okay. at all. Okay. That's why I don't understand the slitless. Okay, now, Muse. Has Muse seen uh, uh, ramp pressure strip galaxies? Yes, this is the first example of using Muse to detect ramp pressure stripping. It's a work by um, Rosario collaborator, dates back to 2019. And it is showing that when you look at HST images of these two galaxies, you see nothing. These are basically undisturbed. These are 
uh, maybe spiral edge on galaxies with nothing particular to show. And when you look at them with mules, you see this very long tail of ionized gas. And these are in a cluster located at Russia 0.7. So this is in fact not a shaft of that oxygen too, because of this Russia mute is not able to follow any more than shaft emission. Okay, so our idea was, okay, we have all the machinery ready. We did a lot of work with gas, but can we use our knowledge, our experience to extrapolate what happens using always MUSE data in intermediate redshift clusters? So we asked these people from the MUSE uh, Lansing cluster GTO team to use their images, the, their data cubes, to look for the presence of rampus or steel galaxies. Um, the MUSE GTO a uh, group observed the 12 clusters. These are the clusters in the redshift range between 0 0.3 and 0 0.5, with uh, news mosaics covering the inner region of the clusters. And by inner, I mean, well, you show, I, I show you later the, the field cover for 27, 44, and 370, but it's basically the inner region of each cluster. And inner is a point two in terms of R200. So it's really the cluster course. Because it takes a lot of time to perform, to, to make up these mosaics. The exposure time of each one uh, of this field, which compose the mosaic is uh, at least five hours or even more. This one has been observed for 15 minutes. So it takes a lot of time to have these images, these cubes actually. Okay, these are the field covered by news mosaics in about 27.44 and about 370. It's a field of two by two arc minute square, which is half a megaparsec inside, more or less in both of them. And the news GTO team were able to find in this uh, field more than 150 galaxy members in about 27.44 and more than 200 members in about 370. The dots that you see here, these circles, show you the location of the galaxies that we classified as Rampras strip and the post dust in red. So from that image, you, you see nothing, but it's also a low resolution image. I will show you later how it works. So again, Bianca, which has a lot of passion, went and looked and explored each of these data cubes, looking for signatures of ram pressure sitting on one side, which means extra planar emission visible either in the H alpha or in oxygen too. And then she went looking also for signatures of a post harvest population, because we think that the post harvest population is the, the step for the following step in the looking of galaxies that are subject to ram pressure stripping. Okay. And, one question. So if, if, if the main criterion is, is to look for morphology, morphology, how do you uh, uh, consider cases for galaxies that are based on that also applies to the when you show the initial sample at low redshift that you, you have like many galaxies that were essentially based on? So how do you in that case it's very difficult to see the, the phase? It, it's a it's an observational balance. It's more easy to see something that is having a tail in the plane of the sky. If it's moving, um, if the galaxy is really face on, you will not see. But since, since you have the IAP, do you look like for, for example, for uh, increased velocity dispersion in the periphery, et cetera? We didn't, we didn't do that, yeah. But we the resolution of music is not very high. No, it's a medium resolution. So, she did something like this, you know, with uh, exploring the data cube. She, mo she moved from the galaxy center to where well, we should use this. You will see the HF emission strong here and then decreasing, it, but still present here. That's, that's how we identified candidates. But then we had to confirm that these were really non street galaxies. And so, I'll show you later how it works. <laughs> but just to show you a gallery of the galaxies that we were finding, these are all RGB images uh, extracted from HST data, combining HST data, that shows you how our reference state galaxies look like if you look at them using a photometric, a very good photometric uh, uh, sample. 
and you basically see nothing. You see, this galaxy doesn't look disturbed at all when you look at the HST images, and this one too. And in fact, these two galaxies are, are part of the sleepless effort by the Canning collaborators, and they were classified as mergers, while these two were classified as undisturbed. This one here is the only galaxies for which it was already said by always and collaborators that it was a round pressure strip galaxy. But at that time, they, I mean, they had, I think, this um, fiber spectroscopy of this field. And so they thought that this galaxy was the mother of this trace, but they weren't able to um, prove it because they had only the redshift of this galaxy here. So what did we do? This is a method that we used also for gas, but we extracted the cubelet around the galaxy, each galaxy candidate, covering the galaxy and the extent of the tail. We fitted the emission line with the, our own dedicated software that has been developed by Mario Radovich that fits the emission lines. Um, we measured the stellar kinematics using PK, PPXF, and then having the, both the absorption line redshift and the emission line redshift, we ran the synopsis code that Jacopo made, and we liked it a lot, to derive the best fit of the stellar continuum. We then subtracted the stellar contribution from the initial data cube, and we ended up with an emission-only data cube, on which we could measure, again, using the same software, all the emission line due to the gas component that we then corrected for the extinction using the measured uh, value. Now, the stellar disk here is defined as the ellipsis that uh, best uh, reproduces the three sigma above the background level. And this background has been determined by masking the other objects in the images. So what you see here is something that we did for every galaxy and shows you that um, over here, for example, you have the H alpha mm, flux distribution. The black contour is the disk emission that we used. So you see clearly that there is H alpha emission extending mm, towards this direction. This is the same galaxy that I will show you. This is the oxygen two emission, um, gas kinematics, and stellar kinematics that needs to be compared. Gas velocity dispersion, stellar velocity, sorry, stellar velocity dispersion. Here you have the extinction map, the AB. And here is the BPT classification of each spark set um, that involves the BPT diagram using the nitrogen to know. Okay, so whenever we see that there is a stellar uh, kinematics that is undisturbed, and there is this tail of ionized gas, then we know that there is an unpressure strip at work. And this is true for a number of galaxies, um, which are these ones here. So again, you see the RGB image below, and the red uh, thing is the ionized gas emission. Here is the oxygen too. And as I said, now, galaxies that were looking undisturbed before, like, I don't know, this one, you know, which is the extent of the tail. This one is 27.406. There's a tail that is, I don't remember how long it is, but I'll check it later. This one was really understood, and you see how much uh, long is this tail of oxygen. Tea. So the, the message here, again, is without views, we wouldn't be able to know that there is a pressure saving. And this is very important because uh, the, the main objection that we had for our GASP uh, works in general was, OK, these are beautiful galaxies. We like them a lot. But these are peculiar objects. They are, they are not important in the galaxy evolution. If you find one, two, or three in a cluster, that's enough. But these are, this is not shaping the cluster galaxy properties, which is not true, actually. But this can only be proved if you have an integral fit unit that is covering that is allowing you to study a decent number of galaxies. So for GASP, we needed one muse pointing for one galaxy. And covering an entire cluster with muse is impossible. It will take really a huge amount of time. 
while when we move at higher redshift in this redshift range, we basically cover not only the Rampras strip and the Postavas population, but also many other galaxies that are, for example, the control sample of galaxies. So we think that the Rampras strip is acting on um, late type galaxies. And so using the color magnitude diagram uh, of these two clusters, we excluded from our analysis the galaxies that are already in the red sequence. These are already red and quenched. And we selected only those having a blue color that and a decent magnitude, otherwise we wouldn't see them. So we, we couldn't study them. So we selected blue galaxies and tried to understand how many of these blue cluster population were affected by radiation stripping. So in this plot, you see in blue the galaxies that I was showing you before that are proved to be affected by radiation stripping. In orange, the post harvest population, which we think are connected to the stripping, and in gray, all the other galaxies that make up our control sample. There are 17 of these galaxies in the two clusters, and among these 17 galaxies, 12 are still blue, but are passive galaxies. The, the spectral type is a K type. So that means that they, they have been already affected by some punching mechanism. Probably the round Russian. So if you do the counting here, you end up by uh, knowing that 85% of the galaxy population in the inner region of the clusters that are covered by views observation is or has been already affected by round pressure strip. So round pressure strip is an influent mechanism. It is not producing peculiar objects which you like because they are a beautiful example uh, and you like to look at them. They are really shaping. Uh, galaxy properties in clusters. The other thing that we understood, which was not expected before, um, is that the ratio of the oxygen 2 over H alpha emission is different when you look at the disk and at the tail of galaxies. Now, this is very important because in this redshift range around the 0 0.3, the MUSE and other spectrum are able to cover both the H alpha and the oxygen 2 emission. So, this is a place where you can link, for example, the star formation rates measured with H alpha and with oxygen too. Because what usually happens is, is, well, is, it, is that when you look at low ratio studies, star formation rate in the optical is derived with using H alpha. You move at higher ratio, you only have oxygen too. You use some theoretical formulation, you connect the two and you compare them. Now, here you have both observation. And you can compare what happens if you derive the star formation rate from one or from the other, which uh, Benedetta Vulcani is doing in this precise moment. But the important thing is that uh, the, the theoretical expectation that you have among, uh, on the ratio between oxygen 2 and H alpha is complicated in this kind of galaxies because oxygen 2 is predominant over H alpha in the days. So, this plot shows you the logarithm of the oxygen 2 over H alpha flux. And basically, it says that whenever you see red, then the H alpha emission is stronger than oxygen 2, which you expect in a normal distal forming galaxy. And the other way around, where you see blue emission. We don't know why this happens. We have no idea. It is basically maybe due to the fact that metallicity is decreasing uh, because the gas in the tail is mixing with the metal pool gas of the intracluster medium, but we are still investigating uh, whether this is a real effect or not. Because when we published this work, we didn't have the control sample analyzed in this way. And this is something that I'm doing here this day today together with you. Okay, now let's move to the connection between ground pressure stripping and post harvest population. So when we look Am I running? Yes, thank you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> when we look at the gas galaxies, um, we basically saw that in the places like this small square here, where you don't have any more the H alpha emission, the gas emission, because it has been stripped, what is left over is exactly a, a spectrum typical of a star. And this is points towards a scenario where really 
the, the two things are connected one with each other. If you look at the distribution of Cosandra's population in the phase space diagram, again, you find that the two are compatible. But um, the real proof of the connection is somewhat missing. I don't think that there can be anything else that can explain this, but we needed the same a smoking gun. So we went and looked at the Cosandra's population in these two clusters. And this is a work that Ariel Bern did. And I think that Ariel is coming here in the next uh, months. So um, I will not spoil anything. I will not go into the detail of this work because it's his work. Uh, but basically, he was able to um, understand that Postalbus galaxies really show, when you look at their star formation history, because he modeled this using synopsis. When you look at the star formation histories, really you see that these galaxies show a rapidly quite star formation history followed by um, following a star formation bias. And this is exactly what happens when you have run pressure. When the run pressure okay, acts on a galaxy, it first gives an increase of star formation and then a rapid decline. This is something that we found in gas and is expected and is measured in these galaxies. And not only this, but uh, for the biggest galaxies, it was also able, ah, I didn't show you before the scale, but I will show you later maybe. Um, for the biggest galaxies, it was also able to follow the special distribution of the quenching. And whenever it was able to do that, it measured an outside in quenching, which is a typical signature of this kind of phenomenon. And this is what the, I would call the smoking gun of the uh, connection between run pressure and postal population. This is the galaxies that I was showing you before. It's, for us, it's called about 274401. And you see here a galaxy that has no gas left in its body. And it has only gas in a tail here. And when you look at the stellar population properties of this galaxy, you see that in this part, following the, the, the stripping direction, in this part of the galaxy, in the last 1.5 giga years, which is more or less the time scale of the numbers of stripping, only 10% of the mass has been formed, of the galaxy mass has been formed, while here on this side, where you still have gas left over, let's say, about 25-30% of the um, mass has been put together during the number of stripping. So this is what we call a smoking gun of the connection. So the last thing that we did on these two clusters is to study how they were connected with the global properties of clusters. These are two more, much better images because they have been made by Carlos Bellas and with respect to the one that I did. In magenta, you see, here, you see here the Chandra X-ray emission, and in blue, the lensing mass produced by the GTO team, and in yellow, the extent of the HR emission. So you clearly see the run pressure in action. This is a beautiful image, in my opinion. And when you look at where these galaxies are in the um, phase space diagram, that is, uh, it, it, it's saying how the info history of the galaxies is in the cluster, because it connects the the info projected info velocity of the galaxies uh, to the distance from the cluster center. You see, for example, that in a Bell 2744, you have two mm, substructures merging, and the postalbus and the number stripping population is located basically in this structure here. And this is something that we were expecting because whenever you have two uh, structures merging to big substructures merging in a cluster, you have uh, an amplification of the number of stripping phenomena. And in a bell 370, which is a more relaxed system, the blue galaxies are here, more distant. This is something that we were expecting for what I said before. In the center, in the real center, you only have the red population, and the round pressure strip are isolated in forest. And this is something that we already saw in gas, but this is uh, completely compatible with the round pressure stripping scenario. But then Carlo made another effort, which is very important. So he tried to use a lot of uh, indicators of asymmetry, the usual ones, the Gini, the asymmetry, the concentration, the 20, which I know nothing about. And he started to look uh, in the 
in each uh, two dimensional plane whether the Laplace restricted galaxies were segregated in some way. And this is very important because um, with the advent of future instrumentation, we want to have something that works uh, automatically uh, because uh, Bianca is one, her patient is finite, and she cannot look at every single galaxy in every single survey. And so you need to have something automatic. And we found that the usual indicators are not really powerful, we just expect. And we found this other thing that is the centroid variance that is working much better. And the centroid variance basically look at the shifting of the centroid of the light at different cuts in surface branchlands. And the, this thing here is segregating a associating galaxy uh, very well. His last effort was to put together everything that is something that you do when you know nothing, and you do a PCA analysis, which is never easy to understand at the end. You don't know what happens, but uh, the first two eigenvectors actually uh, contains most of the information of every, of every indicators. And uh, it seems that uh, um, our disturbed galaxies are pretty well isolated. So it is something that uh, it is worth exploring in the future. Okay, so here are my conclusions. Um, so you need news or higher resolution um, or integral field units with even higher spatial resolution to understand the importance of this effect. Otherwise, it will be missed. The numbers of stripping at these redshifts already affects most of the blue galaxy population. This is something you know because you have a large field of view of the center of these clusters. Um, you have an anti-correlation between H alpha and oxygen 2 ratio when you look at the tails and main galaxy bodies. We understood that post harvest population is really linked to run pressure. And it is already, and it is also linked to the uh, motion of the galaxies into the cluster. And finally, there is a combination of morphological parameters that can automatically identify uh, Ramperson stripping candidates. Now, something for the future, the, the very nearby future, my future is to work with the Apple to analyze the, the control cluster uh, galaxies and control field galaxies, and also to measure the spectral types of each galaxy to understand whether the scenario that we have in mind is confirmed or not. And then the real future, I want to just to highlight two future instrumentation that will be helpful in this kind of analysis. One is Mavis. Mavis is going to see its first slide probably in 2030. And it's uh, an integral field unit that will uh, operate on VLT, UT4 and is assisted by adaptive optics, which means that we will be able to resolve uh, each sparser with a resolution of 10 parts, uh, sorry, 100 parser. This is something that we cannot do with MUSE, even at low redshift, unless in the very, very nearby universe. And in fact, for gas galaxies, we needed to go to HST imaging to go down to this uh, special scale. So it is very important. This is an example of, of what uh, we, will able, we will be able to do for 274406, which is one of the galaxies that I was showing today. So we will need many points because the field of view is small, but we will have a very large inspection. And the other thing that will happen maybe on a longer time scale, it will be the WST telescope. This is still in the mind of some people let's say it's a 10 meter class a wide field spectroscopic telescope uh, for which the scientific cases are, are, are being collected and uh, we made our own calculation and we submitted a science case uh, uh, to study the the different galaxy angle types from low to high ratio for example uh, this is about 2744, which is one of the two classes that I was showing you before. But this is a larger field of view. This is three by three. And uh, WST will be equipped with a giant three by three panoramic integral field unit, which means that with only one point, we will, we will be covering a field of view that is larger than the one that we have today with a mosaic of view. So 
I think that this will really change our view on nearby classes and intermediate classes as well. And with this, I leave you and I'm ready to take any questions you have. Please, can you explain a little bit why you said there's a difference in abundances between the H alpha dominated and the L sweet? Because but, I think to remember that the tails also need um, H1. No, no, we don't have. I mean, it could be. I mean, the idea is that there are pressure strips, big strips that are glass. And so if you look at the low rise shift clusters, so the gas sample, for example. Mm -hmm. We have indication that there is H1 emission in it. But at this ratio, you will never we will be never able to see the H1 emission. You will need to wait for the SKA. So the thing that I was saying is that the H alpha and the oxygen 2 emission are anti-correlated. So these are all both ionized gas, and the importance of the oxygen 2 over H alpha is changing when you move from the disk to the tail. But we don't know why. I have no idea why this is happening. But why could be this a difference in abundances? You... In the metallicity, because the metallicity is shaping the properties of the line ratios in a way that I don't know. Because you need to measure all the other emission lines to understand what is going on, which we didn't do. I mean, we had the measurement that we didn't start with. Could it be just like the strength of the shock is different between the two and it's producing different line ratios? Could be. <laughs> so, in this case, you're saying that there would be a contribution to ionization from shocks? Exactly. Uh, is there evidence from shocks? Sir? Yes, from BPT. There is some, for example, here. It's very small, I don't know whether you can see it. Um, red is star forming, orange is composite, so between star forming a AGN or liner. And the green here is the place where you measure line ratio that are typical of AGN emission, which is not AGN, of course, here because you are in the tail in the middle of nowhere. So it's basically shots. Thank you. I have uh, two questions. Uh, one of them is, I think I probably missed it, but when you're talking about the inside out and outside, can you go back to that? Uh, this is a question for Alia, but uh, I will uh, yeah, try to yes. do my best. Yeah. So, um, how do you classify outside and versus inside out uh, in these cases? He was measuring uh, the time scale of quenching at the quantity of mass assembled in the 1.5, last 1.5 giga years. And with these two indicators, it was following. Uh, I need to show you the special scale um, where the stripping happened first and uh, how strong was the stripping. So, the end is it. Uh, but this depends on the fact that you can resolve the galaxies. Right. Um, so, so, it's an image based uh, yes. determination. Okay, okay. And so. But you see here, this is the PSF, like the radio beam. This is one example. So this galaxy could be um, specially resolved. So if you have a star formation on this one example scale, you can see where it has been quenched first and where. Well. So for example, in this galaxy, I suppose that you see the quenching happening here, and here it is not quenched, uh, extremely quenched, because you still have gas. That's how we measure the outside in quenching. And so the points you have on the other plot, they're all resolved galaxies for which? Yeah. Okay. yeah. The other question I had was, uh, you showed the, uh, uh, the PCA, uh, so that you're trying to use that for classification. <laughs> Is that right? We are trying, okay. We, we made the PCA for the galaxies in these two clusters, and we would like to do the same kind of thing for the other clusters. Uh, yes, so no, no, no worries. My question is not about PCA. Okay, um, thank you. Because I agree with you, it's it's uh, it's something difficult to interpret. But I was going to ask if you tried other ways of classification, like uh, convolutional neural network. No, no. Okay. Uh, question? Also, regarding the inside out, outside in, uh, quenching, 
What's going on with the massive ones, Alice? The massive ones, ah. the two most massive ones, do actually have signal to of AGM. But we think they are not shaping the properties. Also in gas, we have a lot of AGM in the massive population, but these are not affecting the, the, the stars and the gas in a way that is able to produce the long phase that we see. So there is a connection, but the, the signatures of stripping are, um, are not due to the AGM. But the two things are connected in a way that we think is uh, not really understood. There is a girl working in our group making simulations, and she finds that it could be that there are pressure stripping enhances the uh, gas in falling toward the center, which wake up, wakes up the AGM. That, that's the idea. Are they face on or edge on? Is it possible? Mainly edge on. Because otherwise we wouldn't select them because we wouldn't see them. The thing. And uh, regarding the cluster with the two substructures, why are the round pressure strip only associated with one of the substructures? I don't know. <laughs> don't know. They are of similar mass. The two substructures. Yeah. I don't know because I don't have the two masses actually. Others? Questions from the remote? I don't see any hands up. Okay. If not, uh, uh, thanks. Uh, and everyone who wants to join for lunch in one hour in front of you. Thank you, Thank everyone. You.